On our newscast tonight, Washington says its forces are ready to strike Syria at any moment and that they are just waiting for their commander-in-chief to give them the go-ahead. The Obama administration grows more vocal in its condemnations aimed at the Syrian government, but says it is not trying to force a regime change. President Park Geun-hye meets privately with leaders of the nation's 10 biggest conglomerates for the first time since taking office. She urges them to make bold investments to create more jobs and hints at easing some controversial regulations. The Korean government announces measures aimed at boosting more home buying and offering more affordable housing options. The plan includes permanently reducing the home acquisition tax and others. These stories and more coming up on Early Edition at 6. It is 4 a.m. in Panama City, noon in Istanbul, and 6 on a Wednesday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Kim hyun -ji. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. Encouraging bold investments to boost a sluggish economy, that's our starting point today. President Park Geun-hye wants Korea's top companies to increase their investments as a means to prop up the sluggish economy. And she told them as much over lunch on Wednesday. Our presidential office correspondent, Ah Jin-ju, reports on what the president agreed to do for the conglomerates in return. President Park emphasized that now is the time for companies to make active and leading investments. During a luncheon with the leaders of Korea's 10 largest conglomerates on Wednesday, President Park said that bold investments made during times of economic hardship were what boosted the sluggish economy and increased the competitiveness of Korean companies. This was the first time since taking office that President Park had met separately with the country's top business leaders, including Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Gun Hee and Hyundai Motor Group Chairman Jung Won Gu. She asked the leaders to work towards job creation, saying that jobs can only be created when companies have the determination to do so, not the government. The president also addressed concerns about her campaign pledge for economic democratization, which aims to create a fairer business environment so that small and medium-sized companies can work alongside large enterprises. She promised to make sure that economic democratization policies will not be distorted into something that choke conglomerates by way of excessive regulations. In particular, President Park hinted at easing some of the more controversial regulations in a revised bill of the Commercial Act, which focuses on corporate governance reforms. The president says she would carefully go over the revisions, including one that would limit the voting power of the largest shareholders to 3 percent when selecting a member of the audit committee. In response, the chairman of the Federation of Korean Industries, Ho chang Su, asked the president to listen to what the companies have to say so that they can do their best to reach their investment and employment goals for this year. Oh jin Shu, Arirang News. The Korean government has just announced a set of measures designed to stabilize the nation's housing market. The announcement came nine days after President Park Geun-hye gave the order. Our Park ji has more. Korea's Ministry of Strategy and Finance, together with the Financial Services Commission and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, have come up with a set of joint measures to revitalize and stabilize the nation's housing market. The government's new housing plan aims to encourage home buying and to stabilize monthly rent and chance prices, which have been soaring in recent years. Chansei is the unique Korean housing system that requires renters to deposit a lump sum of money that is paid back when these contracts expire. Chansei prices have skyrocketed recently to well over two-thirds the value of homes. The recent hikes in Jansei prices are attributed to depressed housing sales and structural changes in the Korean housing market from Jansei to monthly rent 
Responding to the current problems, the government aims to stabilize rent and junsei prices through a set of comprehensive financial measures. The government will do its best to protect the nation's lower income earners. According to the plan, the government will first reduce the home acquisition tax to 1 percent of the price of homes that are valued at less than 530,000 U.S. dollars and to 3 percent of the price of homes that are valued at 800,000 dollars or more. Potential home buyers in the lower income bracket will be able to secure mortgages at a cheaper rate of about 1 percent interest. The government will also work towards supplying more public rental housing and offer more tax benefits for monthly renters to lessen the financial burden on people switching from chance to monthly rent systems. The measures come nine days after President Park Geun-hye asked related ministries to come up with ways to stabilize the nation's housing market. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The Korean government faced the fury of the middle class earlier this month when it introduced a tax code proposal that was intended to squeeze more tax revenue out of regular income earners. That's right. It spurred a debate over who exactly falls into the nation's middle class and the fact that there are less and less who qualify these days. For more on the downward trend and what this means for the nation's economy, we are now joined by Arirang's Pang Jie at the News Center. So, Jie, let's first clarify the definition of middle class. In 21st century South Korea, who are we referring to? Daniel, the OECD defines a nation's middle class as those whose income stands between 50 percent and 150 percent of a country's median income. Here in Korea, that would apply to people with incomes between around 16,000 and 50,000 U.S. dollars. But to many in Korea, the perception is that you're in the middle class if you have a house without any mortgages, earn enough money to feed and clothe yourself and your family, educate your kids and still have a little something left over to stock away. It's a point of reference in a country where there is a stark difference between the reality and the perception of who belongs in the middle class bracket. In a survey conducted by the Hyundai Research Institute on around 1,000 people, more than half of those who fell in the OECD's middle class bracket considered themselves to be in a lower income group. The respondents of the survey said they consider the middle class to be households with a monthly income of around $45,000 uh, after taxes have been accounted for with total assets of around $700,000. Those totals are inflated compared to the OECD's definition of the middle class, which states that homes with a monthly income of $3,200 and total assets of around $220,000 qualify. Well, Chie, so where does the wide gap come from? Well, Yanji, the perception is somewhat based on reality. While income levels do meet the criteria for being in the middle class, they're having to spend more. While the average assets of Korea's middle class rose 13 percent between 2006 and 2012, soaring housing prices and educational expenses over that same period forced middle class debt to rise 30 percent. The most important factor in why people don't consider themselves to be in the middle class depends on the household's income and how much they're spending. Households with more expenditures compared to income will not think of themselves as being middle class. And Jia, another middle class problem we're facing here in Korea is that the number is shrinking, right? Exactly, Daniel. A large number of people have fallen out of the middle class since 1997 when the Asian financial crisis hit the nation. The ratio of the middle class defined by the OECD dropped to 67 percent in 2011, down more than six percentage points from 1997. Since then, the gap between the nation's rich and the poor continued to widen, making it difficult for low-income households to rise into the middle class. The nation's slumping growth over the past few years has also caused the gap to further widen.
The middle class is the backbone of a nation's economy. When more households are included in the middle class, it means the nation's economy is developing and stabilizing. But a shrinking middle class means there are either more high-income or more low-income households, which indicates rising uncertainty about the nation's economy and society. Well, but I can't imagine that Korea is the only nation faced with the problem of a shrinking middle class. No, the middle class is in decline in other major OECD economies as well. The United States, Japan, France and the United Kingdom had their middle class ratio drop in 2011 compared to 2007. And the Samsung Economic Research Institute expects the downward trend to continue due to slow growth in those countries. Japan's middle class, meanwhile, was standardized downward with many households falling into the lower middle class. Germany, however, was able to maintain a relatively stable ratio of the middle class thanks to government policies that, that boost permanent jobs and focus on vocational training. So for Korea, what should we do to build up its middle class? Well, experts say that the government should work on boosting the economy to create more quality jobs. They add that it's also important to lessen the expenditure burdens on households by improving housing and educational policies. All right, thank you for that, Chie. That was our Arirang News, Hwang ji reporting live on the shrinking middle class here in Korea. The business sentiment index for Korean manufacturers improved to a three-month high in September's outlook. According to the central bank's monthly survey, projections on business conditions went up four points to 77 for September, the highest since the figure stood at 79 for the month of June. A reading below the benchmark 100 means that experts are more pessimistic than optimistic. The Korean economy grew the fastest in over two years in the second quarter, increasing 1.1 percent. The Bank of Korea conducted a survey on roughly 2,600 companies nationwide in mid-August. It appears that Kenneth Bae's days as a North Korean detainee are just about over. U.S. Human Rights Envoy Robert King is set to visit Pyongyang this Friday to ask for Bae's release on humanitarian grounds. Our Han Daeun reports. The U.S. State Department and the White House say Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues Robert King will travel to Pyongyang on Friday to free Kenneth Bae who has been detained in the reclusive state since November last year. During the visit, Pe is likely to be released from prison and brought back home with Ambassador King the next day. The missionary and tourism operator had been accused of participating in activities designed to overthrow the North Korean leadership by infiltrating at least 250 students into the country. North Korea has reportedly invited top U.S. officials to visit Pyongyang regarding the issue through the New York Channel, a diplomatic line set up between Washington and Pyongyang. During a humanitarian trip to Asia this week, King said the U.S. had continuously requested for Pez release. We've uh, requested uh, that the North release Mr. Bay on humanitarian grounds. Uh, he, his health is, uh, is suffering and we've uh, requested that he be released. We hope that they will uh, listen to our request. Although the U.S. envoy's talks with his North Korean counterparts will likely be limited to the issue of Kenneth Bay, experts say King's visit may help in easing the standoff between Washington and Pyongyang. This is the first visit to Pyongyang by a top U.S. official since young leader Kim Jong-un succeeded power. In fact, not long after King's last visit to the North in 2011 to free American citizen Eddie Chun, the two countries held high-level talks and discussed North Korea's denuclearization as well as food aid. And as his visit comes amid a series of inter-Korean talks, hopes are high that the elevated tensions on the Korean peninsula may further cool off. And then, Arirang News. Red Cross officials here in South Korea are busy preparing for next month's inter-Korean family reunions at the North's Mount Kumgang Resort. Out of the tens of thousands of families registered for reunions in South Korea, it's a sad reality that only 100 of them will have the chance to see their loved ones again this time around. Connie Lee has more on the selection process for the upcoming inter-Korean family reunions. 
Fathers separated from their wives and children. Brothers and sisters split from one another more than 60 years ago. We're looking for our older brother, Kim nang -guk. He was taken away during the war by the North Korean military at the age of 19. It's a harsh reality for families who were separated by the Korean War. As I've gotten older and since my children have grown and left, I now have this longing to see my own family. I don't know if they'll be found, but it's worth a try. But unfortunately, most of these people here at Korea's Red Cross will not be selected to reunite with their loved ones come September. There are currently about 72,000 registered separated family members in South Korea, but only a fraction, just 100 of them, will be selected to reunite with their loved ones on September 25th through the 30th at Mankumgang in North Korea. The first round of cuts was made through a computer process that filtered out the younger candidates and gave priority to those who were either looking for a child or a spouse. Come Thursday, another cut. The list will be whittled down to about 200 after various health exams of the candidates to make sure they are well enough to travel to Mount Kumgang. Once that happens, South Korea's Red Cross will exchange its list with North Korea to confirm whether the family members they're looking for are indeed alive. Then, the final list of 100. It usually takes us 50 days to get ready for the reunions, but we will get everything together in a month. We are speeding up the preparation process this year. But time is running out for many of these separated family members. Data show that out of those who are still living, 80 percent, or about 60,000 of them, are over the age of 70. I just hope to see them before I die. When I see my siblings, what could I possibly say? I'll probably just hold them, hug them, before saying goodbye again. Connie Lee, Arirang News. South Korean Defense Minister Kim Kwan Jin and U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel met in Brunei on Wednesday and discussed a possible delay in the transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul. The talks came on the sidelines of the second ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting Plus, which runs through Thursday. Minister Kim says he once again stressed to Hegel the need to delay the OPCON transfer that is planned for 2015. He said Hegel seemed to partially agree on the need for a delay, but said there were still different opinions on the matter without elaborating. The timeline of the OPCON transfer is likely to be finalized at the Security Consultative Meeting in Seoul in October. Korea's National Intelligence Agency and the Prosecutor's Office have arrested three left-wing, allegedly pro-North Korean politicians on charges of conspiracies to stage a rebellion and for violating national security law. The three officials, all of whom are members of the minor unified Progressive Party, are accused of plotting a strike on a government facility. The party's vice chairman, Hong Sun Suk, was among those taken into custody. The NIS declined to lay out the details of the charges against the three, but did say that they've been building their case for some time. NIS agents carried out raids on the homes of some 10 UPP members this morning, including Representative Yi Seok Gi, whose whereabouts are currently unknown. Prosecutors believe he fled by taxi while his office was being raided. Military action against Syria by Western powers seems imminent in the wake of last week's alleged chemical weapons attack near Damascus. The U.S. says it is ready to strike at any given moment, but denies its intention is to topple the Assad regime. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. The United States and its allies have told rebel forces in Syria that military action against the Syrian government could be conducted within days. Diplomats from the U.S. and other Western countries warned Syrian opposition leaders at a meeting in Istanbul that military action was about to start and told them to be ready for talks if the government wants to negotiate with them. The U.S. says its forces in the region are ready to strike at any moment and are just waiting for President Obama to give it the go-ahead. The Obama administration insists it is still considering various options and is not trying to force regime change in Damascus. The options that we are considering are not about regime change. They are about responding to a clear violation of an international standard that prohibits the use of chemical weapons. 
British Prime Minister David Cameron says Britain wants to punish the Assad regime for using chemical weapons, but he's keen to avoid getting sucking into a wider conflict. Meanwhile, the Arab League has blamed Mossad for last week's chemical attack and urged the UN Security Council to act. Experts say the announcement could potentially give diplomatic cover to Western powers if they choose to attack. Technically, the U.S. could legally launch military action against Syria without U.N. backing if NATO gives the strike the green light. U.N. backing for any military action is highly unlikely given that Russia, one of Assad's staunchest allies, has veto power at the Security Council. NATO is scheduled to convene an emergency meeting on Thursday to discuss its stance on the matter. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Although the Japanese government has vowed to come up with measures to tackle the radioactive water leak, the situation may be worse than initially reported as studies from last year indicate that radioactive water will contaminate the entire Pacific Ocean in just six years. Our Kim Min-ji reports. This graphic shows a gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific water is being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. Although the results failed to grab attention when first released last year, experts now fear that the hypothesis may become a scary reality after the Japanese government recently admitted that some 300 tons of radioactive water have leaked into the ocean every day. Ms. Hei Murata, a former Japanese ambassador to Switzerland, criticized the Japanese government and the operator of the crippled nuclear plant, Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, for its handling of the situation. TECO recently admitted to leaks of radioactive water. The amount is much more that the simulation had taken into account. The international community has also voiced concerns over the issue, but Tokyo, meanwhile, is busy drumming up support for its bid in hosting the 2020 Olympics. 2020 Tokyo, let's do well. Murata stressed the fact that Japan does not realize the gravity of the issue is more outrageous. If Japan can secure the safety of its own nation, it is being insincere in hosting an international event like the Olympics. It should step out. A Russian nuclear research center had also advised TEPCO to take measures two years ago, just after the incident broke out. But Japan turned down the suggestion. It's now been two years and five months since the nuclear crisis, and Tokyo has finally set out to deal with the problem. However, experts say that it may be too late. The former ambassador also warned that Japan may lose its rights in its exclusive economic zone if it fails to block the leakage into the 200 nautical mile zone. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Moving on to other stories, two South Korean Air Force pilots were killed Wednesday afternoon when their planes were flying crash near an Air Force base in the southwest of the country. The single-engine two-seater plane was being used for a training exercise involving two captains when it went down and broke in two. One of the two victims was found dead inside the jet while the other was killed while ejecting from the plane using a parachute. Air Force authorities have already launched an investigation into the accident to determine its cause. Time for weather. That means we turn to our Hannah Kim. So Hannah, I hear it's not only getting cooler, we can expect some rain. That's right, Daniel. We do expect some rain. And I know it's been hot lately, but tomorrow our temperatures will drop to the 20s. Well, the last time I checked, it was pretty sunny outside. When will these showers begin? Yeonji, as of now, the precipitation should start sometime around dawn or in the morning, so it might be a good idea to carry an umbrella on your way out. In general, we'll have about 20 to 70 millimeters in the Gyeonggi, Gangwon, Chungcheon, and North Cheolla provinces. Now, with the rain, there may be a lot of gusty winds, and at times, we'll have a lot of concentrated rainfall all at once, so be careful if you plan to be outside. Taking a closer look at the four 
forecast. Tomorrow we expect precipitation all day in Seoul as we start off the morning at 24 and reach 27 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, cities in the south like Daegu and Busan will peak to 31 and 29 degrees respectively. Down on Jeju Island and along the southern coast, we expect about 5 to 40 millimeters of rain. And as you can see here, our mercury levels are a lot cooler as Daejeon, Dokdo and Mount Gyeonggang all top out at 28. Well, that's all I have for you today. I'm Hannah Kim and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Hannah. And that's all from us for this hour. Thank you for watching. This is Daniel Chan. And I'm Kim Hyun-ji. Stay tuned to Arirang for more news coming up.